together to worship our Heavenly Father and to spend time studying His Word. If you're visiting here with us, we want you to know that you are a welcome guest. It's possible you might hear something or see something with which you disagree. If so, give us a chance to sit down and study with you. It is our goal simply to preach the Word of God, to study it, and to go to heaven. And so it is our goal, therefore, then to sit down with anyone who would like to study and study together from His wonderful Word. And I'll tell you, studying in this day and age can be a great challenge in studying with other people. When it comes to the variety of things that the world advocates and the world says is right, when God says is wrong, it can make a great challenge for us when we sit down and study with them from God's Word. Because quite often, we'll open up the Word of God and we will say the Word of God says this, but then they'll try to use the Word of God to say the very opposite. Years ago... People frowned upon sexual relationship outside of marriage. It went on. But officially, people frowned upon it. Then you had the 60s. You know the good thing about 1966? It's the year I was born. So by the time I got old enough to understand what was going on, it had already passed and was well seated within the world, I guess. But you know, the, the, a lot of people rejected the idea of abstinence before marriage. Even to this day, when you talk to people about abstaining from sexual relationship before marriage, they will balk at that idea. Well, it's not necessary. When you talk to others about the biblical strict teaching regarding uh, marriage and marriage, divorce, remarriage, you have people who will balk at that idea. But no matter what the world says, we still have the Bible, which is our guide. This morning we're going to address a subject that some may, might say is a hate-filled subject, but it's not. And we're going to talk about this subject and what the Bible says in a way that comes with love, but from the Word of God. A lesson that is designed to help people go to heaven and to keep them out of a relationship with the ones who are in hell. This morning's lesson, we're going, to look, we're going to ask the question, what is wrong with homosexual behavior? What is wrong with homosexual behavior? This lesson is going to surprise you because it's not going to be quite what you're expecting to hear. There was an individual a couple of years ago, well-known franchise restaurant owner, who made a bold statement regarding marriage. And thousands upon thousands of people gathered behind this bold statement and went to his restaurant and probably bought hundreds of thousands of dollars of food from him. And all he said was he believed a marriage should be one man and one woman. But I wonder what would have been the response if he had said, you know what, I think people need to be abstinent from sexual relations until marriage. How many people would pull out of the lines? Or what if he said, you know, I believe in what the Bible teaches on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. How many people would have pulled out of line? Listen, there are a lot of sins within the Bible, and this one is no worse than any other. Okay? This sin does not make someone more despicable than the person over here who's having sex before marriage. Because sin is sin. And the lesson today is going to look at two reasons why homosexual behavior is wrong, beginning with the very first reason, sex outside of marriage is wrong. That's simple. When everything is said and done, that's what it boils down to. I had a discussion one time with an individual who was struggling with this subject as far as within his own life. And I asked him, I said, it seems to me that homosexuality is just all about sex. He says it is. It's not about two guys going bowling together or two girls going out and getting something to eat. It's all about the fulfilling of these desires outside of what the Bible says is a lawful way. There are two identifying words I want to look at here real quick, and we'll go through this rather quickly. 
You'll find the word fornication in the Bible. Some translations, the King James and New King James will use it. Uh, there are instances where the New King James will translate the word pornea as sexual immorality. But this word in the Bible refers to illicit sexual intercourse, and then metaphorically can talk about pagan idolatry. And in Matthew chapter, nine, Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, where Jesus says, If a man puts away his wife, except it be for fornication, this is what he's talking about. It is an infidelity within marriage in this application of it. And it's a simple concept. You know, if you go and have relations with someone other than your spouse, it's fornication. It's wrong. How many people are standing up advocating, you know what, it's okay to go and cheat on your spouse? No. They don't advocate that. Again, how many people would have pulled out of the line if this fella had spoken out against having an affair on your spouse? Because it happens often. But this is wrong. Fornication is wrong. It can also be used, as you'll see on the screen behind me too, as sexual activity outside of marriage. Listen, if you're not married to the person, you stay away from them when it comes to this area. You know, we, we, we get so hyped up over the word what's wrong with homosexuality. Listen, any sexual activity prior to marriage is wrong. People can say what they want. I love the individual. Well, at least it's with the opposite sex. That's got to make it okay. No. It is wrong. Now, adultery is the second word we need to throw in here. You'll see the Greek word there behind me. This is a little more specific. It does reference relationship, unlawful intercourse with another's wife or with someone with whom you are not married while you're married to someone else. Matthew 5, 28, he says, If a man looks after a woman to lust after in his heart, he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now that's a whole nother lesson. We talk about, about pornography and the sins against our spouses if we allow ourselves to engage in that. The sin against God. But the point is, adultery fundamentally is when a married individual engages in sexual relation with another. See, this is a fact that we've got to continue to press upon our young people. Until you are married, you say no. God did not say, here, I'm going to give you a body so that you can spend all your time making your body happy. He gave us a body for one purpose. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20, and let's see what that purpose is. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's start our reading there in verse 12. This is a passage Tommy read for us for our script reading earlier. Paul makes a point that all things are lawful for me, but, not, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now observe verse 13. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. That T-bone steak you like to eat, it's good, but God will destroy it. It'll destroy you as well, you know. He didn't give you a body to fill your belly all the time. You eat as you need to, but your body wasn't given to you to feed. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God didn't give us a body so that we can go and engage in sexual immorality. He gave us a body so that we might serve Him. Verse 14. Now, notice what verse 14 says. We know that He's given us a body to serve Him, but beginning there now in verses 14 and 15, God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Now, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Then he says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, young people, be happy and be thankful to God that he gave you a body. You can do a lot of good things with your body. I've seen people do a lot of amazing things within the sports world with their body. But God did not give you a body to rule your life. He gave you a body 
to serve him. So anything that God says stay away from, well, we stay away from it. And anything God says we can do, we do. That's why Paul so strongly in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 5, urges the husband and wife not to deprive one another of the sexual needs there. Because it is right within that relationship and it keeps them from temptation. Whom will God judge when we talk about this subject? Hebrews 13, verse 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. He says, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. This is a truth the world denies, a truth that the Bible professes. It was something that I was raised by. But even in, in, in 1985 when I graduated from high school, when you talked to someone, you said, I plan on marrying myself a virgin. They would laugh at it. You won't find one. People don't live that way any longer. And it's even worse today in how they advocate such great immorality. Paul considers it part of the works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, note with me there in verse 19. It's not a work of God. A behavior outside of marriage, this behavior is a work of the flesh. He lists four things there in verse 19. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. Here's a simple, under, under, a simple way to understand what uncleanness and lewdness is. What is uncleanness? What is lewdness? I would suggest it's anything that leads to fornication and adultery. It's a simple way of defining it. Any behavior, any, any apparel, any type of desires, anything that leads to fornication and adultery is considered works of the flesh and is worthy of separation from God, the spiritual death. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. I had a brother one time try to tell me that what we're about to read when he says is worthy of death is talking about physical death. I don't believe so. It is much worse. It is a spiritual separation from God. Verse 29 of Romans 1, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. Mur Why is it when people, people get mad when you talk about what's wrong with homosexuality and what's wrong with, 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 with premarital sexual activity, but when you talk about murder, they agree with you there. You know. We won't go to comparing being against abortion and against killing Leo the lion. We won't talk about the ridiculousness there of that. But he continues there. What about strife and deceit, evil-mindedness, their whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also prove of those who practice them. Now, I'm not seeing our culture prove of murder. At least, not the way that generally murder is understood. But you see the point? The world wants to take what God says he will judge and says, No, we misunderstand it. You're not a people of love when you say you have to wait till marriage. You are not a people of God when you claim that sexual activity outside of marriage is wrong. You're a hate-filled people when you say that two people of the same sex cannot engage in sexual relations. But listen, that's not the truth. The truth is we're simply people of God. We are striving our best to follow what the Bible teaches and live by those standards. There are some times I think life would be easier on us if we didn't have the Bible. Because there goes the governor. There goes the guide within our life. There goes the right and the wrong. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we may kick off and die. But the Bible gives us a guideline to live by, a moral compass with which we govern what we say and we govern what we do. And brethren, it makes us the better people. I don't mean better than other people. I mean for our own selves, we're better off with it than we are without it. The Bible does address same-sex relationship. Same warning. You can't make the argument, well, if I'm not with someone of the opposite sex, then it's okay. Because it's not. 
Sodom and Gomorrah, Jude 1, verse 9, the condemnation there came down upon them very specifically because of this. There were other problems with Sodom and Gomorrah. The scriptures talk about that in other places. But Jude chapter 1, verse 7, very simple. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Notice what they went after? Fornication. That's what their life was all about. Same sex or opposite sex, it doesn't matter. That's what their desires were. But they also went after strange flesh. They went for those who left the natural use of the opposite sex and went to the same. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. This is very important. Romans chapter 1. This is a standard not established by us, but by God. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. And, if they, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Just as it, wrong, as it is wrong for a boy and a girl to engage in relationships before marriage, it's wrong for a boy and a boy or a girl for a girl to engage in this type of behavior, in this activity. That's what the Bible says. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, turning back to the text we read earlier. Let's go a few verses earlier. If the, first, if the previous passage was not specific, then this one is going to be for certain. And it was specific. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor covetous, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. There are two words here. Notice the text behind me. We just read it. There are two words within this text that I want to draw your attention to. Notice the New King James renders it homosexuals, and then the term sodomites. The term homosexual in the New King James, the Greek word there translated, it means kind of soft. Metaphorically, a boy kept for homosexual relations with a man, a male who submits his body to unnatural lewdness. All right? There's no misunderstanding about that. She's taught and is rightly defined as homosexual. Then the next one is sodomites. The Greek word here means abuser of self. And in the context, abuser of self with mankind. One who lies with a male as with a female. Yes, very explicit. I understand that. But we live in a culture of things that are explicit all around us. And we are in a culture that has created a tolerance for sin. Not just recently. Not in the last 50 years, not in the last 100 years. We could talk about alcohol, we could talk about gambling, we could talk about premarital activity, we talk about all those things right there. The world has created a tolerance for us. So much so that we appear to be the intolerant one because we refuse to say no. The fact of the matter is, the Bible says this behavior is wrong. So let's look at some three simple rules as we conclude the first reason. In regarding the sex outside of marriage. Men, here's your rule of thumb. Unless you are married to the lady, you keep your hands to yourself and your desires under control. That's your responsibility. Until you get a ring, until you put a ring on her finger after having said, I do, you don't. It's that simple. Doesn't matter what your friends around you are saying. This is God's will. Ladies, what's your responsibility? I had fun wording this one just right. Ladies, unless you are married to the man, keep your hands to yourself and your lustful attributes covered up. I did have lust-causing attributes, but I had to change that because then it blames the woman solely. So I said, what do you mean by that, John? Well, let's use your common sense. Ladies, you know what guys look at. You know what catches the attention of guys. This isn't rocket science. 
I mean, look at the movies. And if you want to increase the money flow to certain movies, consider what you got to show and you'll get it. So we know how this works. Especially if you're married, you know how this works. And so use your common sense and keep yourselves covered up and your hands to yourself. And to the men and ladies together, sexual activity with someone of the same sex violates God's law. It's that simple. So keep yourself pure until marriage. See how simple that is? What's wrong with homosexual, what's wrong, what's wrong with homosexual relationships? Same thing it is wrong with sex outside of marriage. It's that simple. It is against the law of God. Reason number two why homosexual behavior is wrong. It's because God's definition of marriage is very fixed. Someone might say, although I've never heard this, and I'd like to know if any of y'all have heard this. Well, I agree with the abstinence till marriage. I just think two people of the same sex can get married. They just don't need to do anything until they get married. I've never heard that. Typically, if they believe they can marry, they're going to be advocating behavioral uh, things prior to the marriage anyway. But the fact of the matter is, it's, notice what God says is undefiled. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, God gives approval to the marriage bed. The apostle Paul says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Stay where you're at. It is chapter 12. Hang on. I put the wrong verse down. Verse 4. Boy, it's so close. Hebrews 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Marriage is honorable. And it is the bed that is undefiled. When he says the bed is undefiled, it is the marriage bed. It is talking about sexual relationship. But it tells us then sex outside marriage. The sex bed, if you, the sex outside marriage is a bed defiled. All right, so what type of marriage has been sanctioned by God? Well, this is very simple. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, we're not going all the way back to Genesis. We'll let Jesus do that for us. In Matthew chapter 19, note with me there beginning in verse 4, and we'll read down through verse 6. And you're going to see this is, is so incredibly, incredibly simple. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. I saw the other day in researching this, I found an argument that answered this argument, or they thought it did. They said, in the beginning, God made man and woman because of procreation. But now the world is already filled, so you're not limited to a man and woman. Human reasoning is what it is. It's human reasoning. The fact is, in the beginning, God made a man and woman, and God bound the man and woman together in marriage. It's that simple. Romans chapter 7, verses 2 through 3. To suggest that God would bind two people in marriage who are of the same sex is to say something the Bible doesn't clearly teach. Romans 7, verse 2, for the woman who has a husband is bound. By the way, did you know they had same-sex relationships back during this time period? They did. It, this is nothing new. So if Jesus wanted to authorize it, now would have been the time to have done so. The Jews would have kicked him out because of it. But he wasn't teaching for the benefit of the Jews. He's establishing a new law. So let's go ahead and bind it if it's bindable. But he didn't. Paul in his teaching says, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man. You see that? The woman, the man, the woman, the man, the woman, the man, the woman, the man. Marriage is not bound by God or not scriptural marriages. doesn't matter what we say about it. Whether you're talking about a man who is unlawfully married to a woman because the standard established by the Bible, or two men married or two women married, it doesn't matter. God does not bind the marriages that are not according to his word. And the fact of the matter is no law of the land can change it. Let all the judges vote all day long. I saw an article the other day, or a little one of those nice little things people like to share on Facebook that remind you of things and everything. Supposedly, Bill Clinton, our former president, tried to pass this type of law. The Supreme Court said, nope. It was a law that would have allowed same-sex relationships and marriages. Recognized, that is. The Supreme Court said, nope, can't do it. But our current president got it pulled off, you know. 
doesn't matter what the world says. From the beginning, God has bound in marriage. Let's see. Let me, let me stay on this chart right here. God has bound in marriage those who are in accordance to his scriptural guidance. Matthew 19, verse 9, if you commit adultery on your wife and she decides to kick you out of the house and divorce you, you cannot remarry. If you divorce your wife because she burnt the toast, you cannot remarry unless it's to her. I mean, these are biblical grounds and, and, and principles established in the Word of God. And so no matter what the law of the land says, from the very beginning, what God has bound is as it is going to be. But it's nothing new. I mean, God says don't murder, but the Supreme Court says it's okay to murder your unborn child. I mean, the world is going to be doing this all the time. But God's law never changes. One married, one man, one woman, bound in marriage by God, is the biblical definition of marriage. Say what you want. Let the world say what it wants. In the end, the Bible doesn't change. We might interpret it differently. People may come in and, as I gave it by example all ago, try to pull verses out of it. One individual said one time, well, you know, they used to wear head coverings, but they don't require that anymore. This probably falls under that same category. Homosexual relationships were opposed by Christians back then by tradition. Now it's acceptable. A misuse of the Word of God. In the end, people are going to do what they want to do, Okay. But as children of God, we have a very, very, very specific responsibility. Turn with me real quick to Ephesians chapter 6. And let's take a moment to look at verses 10 through 13. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6, here's our responsibility when it comes to any subject, including this subject. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the sage, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And that's our responsibility. No matter how warped, warped is what I said, or twisted the world may be, it is our charge to stand for the truth. And so, what is our responsibility in this regards? Christians, keep yourself sexually pure. If you are unmarried, you remain abstinence until married. And you say, what if I never get married? Well, you stay abstinence till the day you breathe your last breath. It's that simple. It's the biblical law. Keep ourselves only for our spouse. Keep yourself pure so that when the day you marry your spouse, you'll be pure for your spouse. Uphold the marriage relationship as established by God. Not just in your own life, but in your presence in the world. Be willing to stand up for what the Bible says and teach the world so that you might be a light that shines in a very dark and ugly world. If you're not a Christian, I recognize we've really not talked about your spiritual needs, but you do need salvation. You're living in a world that is continually pulling you farther and farther and farther away from God. You need to come to Him today. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Word of God, it's a belief, a conviction established within His Word, then why not act upon that conviction and turn away from your sin? Turn to a life that is in full obedience to God, obeying His command to be baptized, so you rise up then to walk in the newness of life. That's what you need to do and in all your past sins. By the way, no matter what you've done, no matter what relationships you've been in, all your past sins, whatever sin is there, is washed away by the blood of the Lamb. Will you do that this morning? If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully, I, I hope and pray that what we have talked about this morning does not, that, there, that this is not within your life, but even if it is, repent. Turn away from it. Live your life right before God. No matter what you've done in, as a Christian, no matter how far you've fallen, you can come back to God today. And with a repentant and a contrite heart, be restored back to His fellowship. If you need the prayers of the congregation, are you ready now to become one of His children? Please come forward as we stand and as we sing.